بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد So we begin with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with whose blessed name all good deeds should commence The Quran has Bismillah before every surah and the the strong view of a large group of ulama is that Jibreel alayhi salam recited the surah with Bismillah or that he had, he instructed Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam to have Bismillah written before each surah. There is a difference of opinion whether Bismillah is the part of every surah or not. There is a difference of views in this. According to most of the Shafi'i scholars, Bismillah is a part of each surah. According to the Ahnaf, Bismillah, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim itself is only a part of Surah An Naml where it is mentioned in the verses Innahu min Sulaymana wa Innahu Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. That is the only place where the Bismillah is an integral part of the surah. As far as all the other surahs are concerned, Bismillah is something that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would recite. He was commanded to recite it, but it was not revealed along with the surah. Hence, according to the Shafi'is, the ayat of Al-Fatiha, Al-Fatiha begins with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and this is why they recite Bismillah out loud in the Salat, because it is a part of Al-Fatiha. Ahnaf say that it is not a part of Al-Fatiha itself, uh, rather, it is an undesignated part of the Qur'an that has been inserted as fasil, as a separator, a divider between all of the surahs. And to be read at the beginning of every surah, except for Surah Al-Bara'a. Surah Al-Bara'a, Surah At-Tawbah, which does not have Bismillah. It begins with Bara'atun min Allahi wa Rasulihi. This surah, <coughs> Surah Yusuf, commences with Alif Lam Ra. These are three letters that are from the Huruf Muqatta'at, also called Huruf Muqatta'a. Muqatta'a means separated, disjointed, the disjointed letters. These occur at the beginning of some 29 surahs of the Qur'an. There are 29 surahs in the Qur'an that have these Huruf. On page 26 and 27, you will see a chart that lays out each one of those surahs and the huruf, the letters that they commence with. So on the left column, you have all the letters or the groups of letters. And on the right column, you have all the surahs that use them. So for example, Alif Lam Mim, just Alif Lam Mim by itself is at the beginning of six surahs. Al-Baqarah, Al-Imran, Ankabut, Rum, Luqman, and Sajda. And like this, you can go through and see. Now, what do these letters mean? What is the meaning of these letters? Is it known to us or not? So, there are two general views about this. One view is that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And its meaning was not revealed to any human being. Therefore, we should not try to delve into them. The second view is that it is possible for us to reach the meanings of these disjointed letters. And remember, they're called disjointed because they're not read in a joined way. Like Alif, Lam, Mim, each letter is read separately. They're read in sequence, but each letter is pronounced separately. That does not happen in, uh, in prose. Wherever there is text, uh, it's recited, the letters form words. In this case, the letters do not form words. Thus, disjointed. So, there was a group of Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, amongst them were the four Khulafa, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu. And they said that these huruf are unknown and they shall remain unknown. Why were they concealed? They were concealed as a test. And the wisdom behind it, uh, there could be many wisdoms behind it. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. As far as the group that says that no, the meanings can be understood, 
there is a statement from Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, one narration from Ali radiallahu anhu, that um, yes, there is a meaning. Some have said that these represent various names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they are like acronyms for various names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Alif, for example, could represent Allah. Lam could represent Al Latif. Ra, uh, Meem could represent any of the names that begin with Meem, like Al Mu'min, Al Muhaymin, uh, Al Muhsi, Al Mubdi, Al Muqeet. It could represent any of those. Or it could represent the last letter of Al Qayyum. And Ra could be for. Uh, Rahman, as an example, some scholars said that these letters are written as a challenge. They are written as a challenge to the Arabs who at that time were at the peak of eloquence in the Arabic language. Their ability to compose poetry and even just in their prose, in their daily speech, they were so eloquent and articulate that you will not find an example of this in other civilizations where people abruptly and without any without any deliberation were able to just express themselves through poetry so the poetry was as we say it would come out irtijalan it would just come out just like that as if they're talking so normal people have to think about formulating their sentences even when they're emotional. In fact, often when we're emotional, we have to think a little bit more about how am I going to word this? How am I, I'm too caught up in these emotions. How am I going to present this to, to the person I'm speaking to? But for them, it all just came out in poetry. It came out in rhymes. It came out with very powerful words, with idioms, with metaphors and similes. So these huruf were, were put at the beginning of the surahs as a challenge to them, that you use these letters every day to form beautiful words, phrases, couplets, and expressions, yet you cannot come up with something that matches the eloquence of this Qur'an, something that matches its articulation, its language, its style of presenting information, its... Um, uh, its selection of the words you could not and you cannot and you will not فَإِلَّمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا You haven't been able to and you won't be able to come up with something like this Qur'an. And so the, the challenge of the Qur'an happened at different levels. So the first level was that كُلَّ إِنِ اجْتَمَعَتِ الْجِنُّ وَالْإِنسُ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لَا يَأْتُونَ بِمِثْلِهِ وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ ظَهِيرًا If all the jinns and all the human beings in the world were to assemble and make a joint effort, make it a, a massive global project, where all of humanity is involved and you try to compose something like this Qur'an, produce a book like it, you will not even if you are all helping each other. So when this challenge was given, no one was able to rise to it. Then the challenge was stepped down. قُلْ فَأْتُوا بِعَشْرِ سُوَرٍ مِثْلِهِ مُفْتَرَيَاتِ Okay, you can't bring the whole Qur'an, try to bring ten surahs. وَدْعُوا مَنِ اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ You can call whoever you need for help. Call all your linguists and your masters of eloquence, your poets, call everyone. So there also, they were not able to. And... Then the Qur'an said, okay, suratim min mithlihi. Try to bring one surah like it. Try to compose one surah like the surahs of this Qur'an. Again, they failed. Then the Qur'an said, fa'tu bi hadithim mithlihi in kuntum sadiqeen. Try to bring one phrase, one sentence like it if you, are, if you are truthful in your speech. So these letters were a part of that challenge. And look, it's the same letters. I'm presenting them to you. Here they are separately. Can you use them to compose something like this? You cannot. Allahu Akbar. Some have said that these letters are acronyms for small phrases. Like, 
Alif Lam Mim represents a phrase, Anallahu A'lam, I am Allah, I know more. Alif Lam Ra, Anallahu Ara, I am Allah and I see. This is the Qawl of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhum. And another view is that these are the names of the surahs. These letters represent the names of the surahs. So you have two major opinions. One is that there is no meaning. There's no need to delve into it. And others have said that, yes, there is possibly a significance and a, a meaning that we may be able to understand. Tilka ayatul kitab al mubin. These are the verses of the kitab that is mubin. Now, mubin can mean clear. I used the translation enlightening here because enlightening is something that is clear and offers clarity. The word in Arabic that represents clear in and of itself is bayin. Something is bayin, something is clear. But here it's going a step beyond that. Mubin abana yubinu ibanatan means to give clarity. So it's clear, it, it keeps the original meaning of clarity. It is clear within itself, but it also gives clarity on many things. It is a book that elucidates, it is a book that illuminates, is an enlightening book. So, what makes the Qur'an so clear and uh, enlightening? Well, the verses are lucid, eloquent, bold, the examples are coherent, they're easy to understand, the proofs and arguments are very powerful. And this book has not, because this book has not originated from any human source, it is filled with many miraculous accounts. Now, miraculous accounts are of various types in the Qur'an. For example, it conveys information that people at that time had no way of accessing. For example, the story of Surah Yusuf. They had no way of accessing that information. The Prophet Muhammad Wasallam had no way of accessing that information. He could neither read scripture, nor could he write. He had no teachers from humankind. He was out in Mecca, which is isolated from the rest of civilization. So there is no way that he could come up with an account like this so thorough. So it gives clarity on questions. People raised questions. People needed solutions. The Quran gave all of that. Similarly, the way that it, it gives clarity on issues of lawful and unlawful. What are the limits and what are the boundaries? What are the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We have revealed this book as an Arabic recitation or recitation. The Quran was revealed in Arabic. So, so that you, this is referring to initially the, the Arabs to whom it was revealed, but it is not. The comprehension of the Qur'an is not limited or restricted to the Arabs. So kum here could mean all of humanity, but all of humanity doesn't speak Arabic. So how could then all of humanity understand it? Because the message that can be conveyed in Arabic for humanity cannot be conveyed in any other language. So the eloquence of the language, the clarity, conciseness, Meaning, Arabic has the, the power of conveying large amounts of information in the fewest possible words. It conveys entire concepts, entire principles or ethics or morals in such few words that it's not possible in any other language. For example, وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِصَاصِ حَيَا In Qisas, in the system of retribution, there is life. Retribution meaning if someone has caused bodily harm to another person. Somebody has taken their life or done less than that. Somebody has gouged out someone's eye, cut off their ear, cut off their hand. There is a system in which the victim is allowed to seek retribution for physical harm. Allah says, in this is life. The simple sentence is, وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِصَاصِ حَيَا In qisas, in equal retribution is life. What does that mean? Behind it is an entire story of how human life and its sanctity is preserved by making people understand that there will be consequences if you cause bodily harm to another person. 
So the entire philosophy of that is embedded in lakum fil qisasi haya in these three words. So the obviously no translation can can perfectly convey the precise meanings and the subtle nuances of this uh, of this language of the Quran. Secondly, the first recipients of the Quran were the Arabs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not just want to reveal the Quran in Arabic, but He chose them to become the foundation for what Islam would be. So He had selected them to take this message, preserve it, and convey it to the rest of mankind. So of course it had to be, it's more than just speaking to them in, in a language that the Arabs understand. It's about a broader selection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, is, that has occurred in the background where Allah azza wa jal has chosen Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and his companions to be the flag bearers of this religion. That's why Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu says about the companions that اِخْتَارَهُمُ اللَّهُ لِصُحْبَةِ نَبِيِّهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose them, handpicked them to be with this Prophet. So, obviously if these were going to be the flag bearers, those people who take the message of Islam and then convey it to the rest of the world, then the Qur'an had to be in their language. نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ We narrate to you the best of narratives. In revealing this Qur'an to you, we relate to you the best narrative. Now, I mentioned in the last session that there are two views regarding what Ahsan al Qasas is referring to. One view is that this refers to the whole Qur'an. The whole Qur'an is the best narrative because the Qur'an presents, as we mentioned, uh, information and even the stories in a way that uh, is unprecedented and it's not within the capacity of human beings. And it's unlike other books, unlike other books, in many books, the meaning the previous scriptures that were held by the people of the book, there are major, major uh, conflicts and contradictions which cannot be reconciled. For example, in the Hebrew Bible, which is also referred to as the Torah, there is agreement that the the version that is with people, this was not all delivered by Musa alayhi salam. It couldn't be because it has news of his, it has the whole story of his own passing away. And it has the story of the conquest of Al-Quds, which happened at least 40 years after he, well, somewhere between, not necessarily 40 years, but after the period of 40 years of wandering around in the desert at the hands of Yusha alayhi salam. So obviously this was not something that was written by or delivered by Musa alayhi salam. Secondly, within it, there are various versions, conflicting versions regarding, for example, the, the flood in the time of Nuh alayhi salam. So the Qur'an does not have any such contradiction. So from that perspective and others, the Qur'an is the best narrative. And others have said it's referring to this surah, this surah is the best narrative. Why? Well, we mention it, um, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has combined many different things in it, many different elements, and often the elements are contrasting. They are so opposite, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings them together in the same story. So for example, those who are jealous and the one they are jealous of, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings them together. The master and the slave brings them together. And the story covers things from both perspectives. The witness, those who are bearing witness, and the thing that was witnessed or the people that were witnessed. Those who fall in love and those who are loved. Yaqub alayhi salam, for example, his extreme and immense love for Yusuf alayhi salam, and Yusuf alayhi salam. Or in the case of Zuleikha, whose love was an unlawful type of love, and then the subject of that love was, again, Yusuf alayhi salam. Imprisonment versus freedom. Abundance versus drought, famine, and poverty. Error and then the pardoning of the error. Separation 
from one's beloved and then being united again with the beloved. Sickness and then health. Remaining in one place and traveling. Humiliation and disgrace and honor. So it brings a lot of these contrasting threads together and weaves them in a beautiful, in a beautiful pattern. Even though before this you, meaning O Muhammad were from those who were unaware. Ghafil here means unaware. You were not aware of this story. You did not know how this happened. And in the background, one of the uh, causes of, of revelation, one of the asbab of nuzul that's mentioned, is that a group of the people of Makkah went to Medina to ask the Jewish rabbis there if they could verify the authenticity of this person who claimed to be a prophet, Muhammad sallallahu And how could they know if he was a true prophet? So they said, ask him if he knows how Bani Israel ended up in Egypt. If he can give you an answer to that, then he is a prophet. Now in their mind, he would only know that if he was from Bani Israel. Because to them, prophethood was restricted to Bani Israel. God was restricted to Bani God was only the God of Bani Israel. He was not the God of anyone else. And prophethood was restricted to Bani Israel. So he had to be an insider. And if he was, he had access to this information. That meant he was from Bani Israel. He knew the previous scriptures. That meant he was a prophet. That was coming from their perspective. So these people came and they said, Okay, tell us. If you can tell us how Bani Israel ended up in Egypt, then we'll accept you as a prophet. Allah Azza wa Jal conveyed and revealed this entire surah to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was not from Bani Israel. Allah says, You had no... Uh, you had no awareness of this story and these events. We revealed it to you in the form of the most beautiful narrative. While the question was answered, a beautiful story was gifted to us in the process. Then we move on to the next passage, verses 4 to 6. And you'll notice that uh, there are many blank pages in here. Those pages have been inserted deliberately so you can take notes if you so wish. Now the story commences. That was the introduction to the story, a bit of background. And the story commences. Now there was a story before this story which is covered in the introduction. It's mentioned there in all of those, uh, in all of those pages. It's a worthwhile read to understand where all of this is coming from what happened before this, what led to this. Now one day, Yusuf alayhi salam says to his father, Yaqub alayhi salam, Ya abati inni ra'aytu ahada ashara kawkaban wa shamsa wa al-qamara ra'aytuhum ni sajideen. I see, or I have seen in my dream, 11 stars and the sun and the moon. I saw them prostrating to me. So, as is well known, the, um, the stars, the 11 stars represented his 11 brothers. Yaqub had 12 sons, his 11 brothers. And the sun and moon represented his parents. Okay. Now, there is a question that arises. That how can, if this was something to happen in the life of Yusuf salam, if this was in fact going to happen, that all of these people would one day bow in front of him in his life. How is that possible when Yusuf Islam's mother had already passed away? Isn't it? Yusuf Islam, for those of you who read the introduction, you'll know what I'm talking about. Yusuf Islam's mother passed away when giving birth to Binyamin, his younger brother. So how is she going to prostrate to him? How is she going to submit to him or bow in front of him when she has left this world? So there are two answers to this. One answer is that the son here is representing his aunt, Rahil or Rachel, uh, sorry, Leah. Yusuf Islam's mother was Rachel, Rahil, and her sister was Leah. Both were the wives of Yaqub salam. This was allowed in the Sharia of Yaqub salam. So, 
Like our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi has told us, Al Khala tu bi manzilatil um. Khala holds the status of the mother. Khala has a very special status in Islam. She is like the mother. So, and she was not just his Khala, she was the mother of his half brothers. So, effectively, he is under her care. After, of course, his mother has passed away. So she is the mother of that whole uh, family of brothers. So Imam Razi rahimahullah says that the son here represents his maternal aunt, Leah, and not his biological mother, uh, Rachel. And others say that... Uh, the son has some other relevance here, power, wealth, rise to um, a high status and position. But the view of Imam Razi rahimahullah seems to make sense. It seems to be uh, easy to understand and, uh, and very applicable. So sun and moon, now question might arise, why the sun? Why would the sun be his mother and the moon be his father and not the other opposite way around? There are various reasons for that. One of them is that Shams in Arabic is Mu'annath. Shams is feminine and Qamar is masculine. Therefore, the, it makes sense that the sun denotes uh, the female member and the moon denotes the male member. This is uh, one possible reasoning behind it. There could be others as well. So Yusuf salam narrates this dream to his father Ya'qub salam does not interpret the dream on the spot. He simply tells him, لا تقصص رؤياك على إخوتك فيكيدوا لك كيدا. For now, the instruction is, do not relate your dream to your brothers, lest they devise a plan against you. They might start plotting against you. So, he knew, Yaqub salam knew that these brothers are extremely jealous of Yusuf salam. They felt that Yusuf salam was getting a disproportionate amount of attention from their father. And he is more beloved to our father. Now, one of the discussions I have with classes when I'm teaching this is that why would they care? Why should they care? What does it matter? Okay, fine, he loves one son more. Well, first of all, this is a natural thing amongst siblings. That every sibling wants to be, uh, uh, wants to be more desired by the parents. They want to have the attention of the parents. Every sibling vies for the attention of their parents. This is a natural thing. Interesting thing is these, most of them are grown-ups now. I mean, Yusuf alayhi salam is young and then Binyamin is younger, but all of these guys are adults, especially if you read the story of their sister Dina and what happened with her and how they went and they, they killed the people that kidnapped her. See, these are grown-up men. These are, you know, so are they still being jealous? So this is not like an immature sibling rivalry type of a thing, but rather the implications of that were very great. Prophets, someone might say that, okay, it could be that Yaqub was a very wealthy person and, you know, they, um, they aspired to uh, inherit that wealth after him. But the thing is, like Nabi Sallallahu has told us, نَحْنُ مَعَشَرَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ لَا نُورَثْ مَا تَرَكْنَا صَدَقَةً We do not leave behind anything in inheritance. So the wealth and the properties of the Prophets are not passed down to their, um, uh, to their successors, to their progeny, to their children. No. Whatever wealth a Prophet has at the time he passes away, it's all distributed in charity. So there wasn't much wealth for them to have, but there was something else. There was the authority that came with being a prophet and being the elder of that nation and also possibly prophethood. That if this boy, this brother of ours, this half-brother of ours is getting all of this attention, then maybe he will be the true successor of Yaqub after he leaves. And successor meant having all the influence, having all the power, having all the authority as a prophet of Bani Israel. 
So there could have been various reasons for this underlying jealousy. So Yaqub detected this, he knows it, he's not oblivious to it, and this is going to matter up ahead when we talk about what happened with Yusuf alayhi salam. Yaqub is well aware of what is happening amongst his sons. But he also doesn't lay it all on his sons themselves. He says, Inna shaytana lil insani mubin. Shaytan is an open enemy. Now remember that this is a pious family. This is a, pi uh, this is a family, in fact, that was representative of religion at that time. Yaqub is the, you know, he's, he's the prophet. He's also the patriarch of, of what becomes religion. So this is how shaitan tackles religious people. He will allow them to continue praying and worshipping and maybe giving charities and doing other good deeds. But he sows enmity between them. He brings out sentiments like <clears throat> the sentiment of jealousy and envy. And through this, wipes away all of their good deeds. They fall in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they are left to, to squabble and fight and do all kinds of things that are really beneath them. They're actually, in a, in a normal circumstance, they wouldn't be capable of that, but these things make them capable of um, what would seem almost impossible for even a normal person to do. Khair. In the shaitan al insan, shaitan is the true enemy. He is the real enemy here, not your brothers. But he will, he will do his work, and the moment they hear this, they are going to now become more active in their efforts against you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, or Yaqub alayhi salam says that وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ rabbuk." In this way, <clears throat> just like he has shown you this dream, in the same way he is going to select you or he has selected you and he is going to teach you the meanings of the dreams. So look at that. Yaqub alayhi salam didn't need to give the interpretation. Allah is going to select you and He is going to teach you the meaning of the dreams. Ta'wil al-ahadith The interpretations of events. Ahadith literally uh, events, but here it's referring to events that occur in dreams. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will perfect His favor upon you and upon the house of Yaqub. This went very very far. I mean, the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was perfected for Yusuf alayhi salam. He became the ruler of his time. And that sort of transferred over to Al Yaqub, where they all became the ruling family of Egypt. Each son became the head of a massive tribe, tribes that survived for centuries. And he's going to do this just like. He did this previously with Ibrahim alayhi salam, with your forefathers, Ibrahim alayhi salam, that was your grandfather, and Ishaq alayhi salam, your father. Inna rabbaka alimun hakim. Verily, your Lord is all knowing and all wise. So, this is the end of this second passage. There are some very interesting teachings that are mentioned here at the end of this section. We'll touch upon them before moving ahead to the next passage next week, insha'Allah. Question? Yeah, two questions. What can they say? Yaqub was there? Or can you continue? That's what he said. There's both uh, calls here. Some have said that this is a continuation of the maqula, of the statement of Yaqub alayhi salam. And others have said that no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has interjected here to explain to Yusuf alayhi salam that Yusuf, this is what was about to happen to you. But it could very possibly be a continuation of the statement of Yaqub alayhi salam. Because Sayyidina Yaqub, how we know in the Allah Sayyidina the prophets alayhi salatu wa salam were receiving wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, I know 
obviously it would it would have been revealed to Yaqub alayhi salam. So Yaqub alayhi salam was a prophet while this whole story was. A yes, he was a prophet before all of this. It's interesting how this arises in the like even though the family of a prophet is not free from jealousies and things like that. It's a very 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 clear view. Yeah. We'll 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 delve a little bit more into this inshallah in the next session. Subhanallah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, shalom, la ilaha illa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi